Thank you for today, for this opportunity, for this chance to be in your house, to worship you and to hear your words spoken. And Lord, we pray right now that you would mold us, shape us, open our minds and our hearts to what it is that you want us to learn. Help us to, through your word, to become more like you. Help us, Lord, to to live our lives in a way that points others to Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our, our Savior and our amazing Lord. Amen. All right, so go ahead and take a seat and turn to Nehemiah chapter 4 in your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on. Um, Pastor Chad is uh, in Thailand. He and a group are uh, finishing up a mission trip. Uh, they've been up there uh, working with a medical group, uh, doing medical mission work, and they're also making a lot of good connections for future trips. Um, and Pastor Chet this weekend is off with a bunch of guys uh, from our church doing a men's retreat. And so we're kind of scraping the bottom of the bucket today. You're stuck with me. I joke. I know I'm the best pastor in this church, but I can't just outright say it. Now, we've been studying in Nehemiah for a few weeks now, so let me catch you up because we're in chapter four. I want to tell you what happens in chapters one through three so that you're not lost. So before Nehemiah takes place, the Israelite nation gets attacked and totally demolished. And all the people are scattered all over the known world. Uh, they get shipped off. They get transplanted. And so Israel, the land of Israel itself, is destroyed and devastated. The, the uh, sieging army came in and demolished Jerusalem, tore down all the walls, destroyed the temple, burned everything in sight, and just left it in ruins. And then we get to Nehemiah's day. And in Nehemiah's day, some of the Israelites started returning back to the land of Israel and specifically to the city of Jerusalem. And word comes back to Nehemiah that Jerusalem is in ruins, that these Jewish people had come back, but they weren't safe because there's not a wall to, to protect them, uh, that there are armies that are threatening to invade and kick them out of the city, and they're just suffering, and they're, they're going through all these difficulties, and Nehemiah's heart breaks for his people. And the compassion that he has for his fellow Israelites consumes him. And what he ends up doing is going to the king that he works for. Now he works for a foreign king. Not just works, he's the slave of a foreign king. He doesn't have any rights. He doesn't really have, uh, uh, it's not as if the king is his employer. The king owns him. And his job for this king is he's the cupbearer for the king, which means that at every meal, he would sample the food and the drink before it went before the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. How'd you like that job? Especially if you worked for a king that nobody liked. Yee, that'd be a rough one. Because you're putting your life on the line every single meal of the day. But that was Nehemiah's job. So Nehemiah samples the food for the king. That's his job. He's a slave. He hears word about Jerusalem and the Israelites' uh, state in Jerusalem. And in his compassion, he decides to act. And what he decides to do through prayer is that he's going to go to the king that he is the slave of remind you, he's a slave, he decides he's going to go to the king and ask for some time off from his master who owns him. Guys, if you are an employer, you dread getting the time off things, don't you? The request for time off. Oh, I got to figure out somebody to work for them and shuffle things around. But this guy is not his employer. He is his owner. And he goes to him and says, uh, King, can I have some time off? And the king says, because God has favor with Nehemiah, the, God, the king goes, okay, sure, how much you need? Literally, the Bible says that the king asked Nehemiah, how much time do you need off? And so Nehemiah says, well, here's what's going on. I'd like to go to Jerusalem, blah, blah, blah. And the king says, okay, sounds good. Take the time off. And Nehemiah goes, and, and one other request. Is there any way in the kindness of your heart that you'd be willing to give me millions of dollars worth of construction materials? King goes, sure, 
Let me write you a letter. And he does. He writes him a letter to send with him along the way, along with an entourage to protect Nehemiah. Some army men went with him. And so he goes to Jerusalem with these letters, with this entourage, arrives in Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is he assesses the situation. Because all he's heard is rumors up to this point. So he walks around the entire city and checks out the wall and confirms that all the things he had heard are in fact true. The wall is demolished, it's in shambles, everything's been burned to the ground, there's no protection. And so the next day, he goes to the people, gathers them all together and says, hey, surprise, I got everything you need. I got the materials, we've got the manpower here in the city, let's get to work. And the people say, yes, let's do it, let's get to work. And so they start working. Last week, Pastor Chet talked about chapter three, where it's basically a list of so-and-so built the wall up to this point, and so-and-so rebuilt this gate and hung it, and so-and-so built this part of the wall, and this gate, and hung this gate, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just a list of all of these Israelites rallying, rallying together and finishing the work that God set in front of them. And then we pick up in chapter four. And in chapter four, we read that some of the Ammonites and the Arabs that were living right around them start making fun of them and the work they're doing. They say, <laughs> they're building that wall and it's gonna fall apart in two months. They're using burnt stones, it's just gonna crumble. One of the guys, an Ammonite, actually says, if a fox ran by that wall, it would fall down. Because they thought they were using burnt stones. It, do you know what happens to a stone or a brick when it goes through really intense heat? It loses its structural integrity. Uh, my first job as a minister, my first church job, was in First Baptist Church of Happy, Texas. Yes, Happy, Texas exists. It's not the happiest place on earth, but it does exist. I worked in First Baptist Church of Happy, Texas, and I'd been there about a year, and mind you, this is... Texas Panhandle, Tornado Alley, a tornado went through Happy Texas, went right over the top of our education wing and took it clean off, demolished the education wing of our church, left the sanctuary intact, but demolished the education wing. And so the insurance companies come in, they hire contractors to rebuild, blah, 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 blah. Two weeks after the contractors start, one of the contractors catches a roof eave on fire and burns all of the building down to the ground. I kid you not, this is a true story. Burned the entire building, sanctuary and all, to the ground. And so after they put the fire out and we were allowed back onto the property, I distinctly remember walking up, picking up a brick and being able to crush it in my hand because the fire had destroyed its strength. That's what the Ammonites and the Arabs think that they're rebuilding the wall with. They think that they're rebuilding the wall with these fire-destroyed stones. They don't realize that Nehemiah brought in all new construction materials. And they're rebuilding the wall with brand new stuff. So the people hearing these mockings that are going on just start working harder. And start building more of the wall. It says that the wall got almost halfway built in a very short amount of time. And then the challenges came. You see, your faith will be challenged. As a follower of Christ, it is a guarantee that your faith and my faith and everyone who follows Christ's faith will be challenged. Jesus promised it in John 15, Matthew 5, Matthew 24. You can go and read those chapters about how Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will indeed persecute you. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're gonna go through challenges. It is a fact of our faith. So if we know that we're gonna go through challenges, why don't we prepare ourselves for them, right? If we know that tough times are gonna come, why not be ready for those tough times? So, so we need to know, first off, what challenges our faith? What are those challenges that are gonna come against our faith in difficult times? 
Well, there are many challenges that can come. There's whole lots of different kinds of challenges. But I think Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, sums up and kind of categorizes all of the different challenges that can come against us. So let's look at Nehemiah 4, 10. It says, in Judah it was said, so this is the people in the city that are doing the work. In Judah it is said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Verse 11, and our enemy said, so this is the outside voice coming in. Our enemy said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. And then verse 12, at that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions. So these are their very own people who are still scattered, who have not returned back to Israel. Those people came and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. Now this gives us three challenges that will come against our faith. And the first one is in verse 10, and it is doubt in God. The first and possibly the most dangerous challenge to us is doubt in God. In verse 10, they start doubting whether they can do the work. They stop putting God as part of the equation in finishing what God has set them to do. You see, if God's going to put a job in front of you, he's going to equip you to finish that job. But they have took God out of the equation. They stopped depending on him. You see, every single one of us at some point are going to go through a moment or a period of time where we doubt God. Where we doubt God's even existence. My early years of college were actually defined by doubting God. I went through high school, uh, you know, very strong Christian. I went to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. And then I graduated and all the stuff that I had been learning in high school and was getting ready to learn in college started making me doubt whether God was really real, whether he really existed or not. And so I went into college and I majored in biology with an emphasis in evolution thinking that if anything could disprove God, it was evolution. And I majored in that for three years. And at that end of the three years, I actually came out with a stronger faith than when I started the program. Because I went into that program saying, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm open to either option. I don't know if God exists. I'm not sure if science and God can work together but one thing's for sure, if I see evidence for God, I'll go that direction. If I see evidence against God, I'll go that direction. I was open to either possibility. You see, doubt is not necessarily a bad thing. Doubt can actually turn us and bring us closer to God as long as in that doubt, we truly seek what is the truth rather than just listening to any voice that will come our way. The problem that I see all too many times is someone starts doubting in God and rather than going and seeking the experts and seeking the truth, they'll go and read something on the internet and believe that. Because let's face it, everything on the internet is true. <laughs> you laugh, I read that on the internet, so it must be true. But the fact is, is that too many times we go through doubts and we'll believe anything that anybody says, whether they've got the credentials or the knowledge or not. But rather, when you go through doubt, God calls us in your doubt to seek the truth. And the truth will set you free. The truth will make known what is real. At the end of those three years in my major of evolutionary biology, I came out of that knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was true, that evolution and the studies that I was going through didn't actually point away from God, but pointed to God. And I came out with a stronger faith than I ever had had previous to that. If you're going through a time of doubt, go seek out the real truth, not the opinions on the internet. Go seek out the experts in the field. So let's say we get to a point where we don't doubt his existence anymore, but we get to a place where we doubt his power. We say, you know, God's all powerful, he's up there, but he's not all powerful in my situation. You know, God's powerful in everything, but he's not big enough to handle what I'm going through. And that's a dangerous doubt to live in. 
We can doubt his love. We can look at our life and go, how could a God who's perfect up in heaven love me? Love a horrible sinner like myself. And we doubt his love. You know what the Bible says about God's love? It is limitless and unconditional. His love for you is not based off of what you do or don't do. It's based off of what he did for us. And that will never falter. He sacrificed his one and only son so that we could be loved by him. And that love is not based off of how well you perform as a Christian. It's based off what his son did for us. So never doubt his love. And lastly, we doubt his promises. And the hard part here is that many of us in this room don't even know God's promises. Did you know that the Bible promises, Jesus himself promised, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Do you live in that promise? Did you know that the Bible says that where two or more are gathered, God is there among them? God is in this building with us right now because there's a lot more than two of us gathered in his name. But do you live by that promise? Do you live your life in his promises? So doubt. Doubt is the first challenge to our faith. The second challenge to our faith is fear. And we see that in verse 11. It says, and our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. They had a genuine, real reason to be afraid, didn't they? They had guys that lived five miles away that were verbally saying, hey, we're coming and we're going to kill all of you. They had a real reason to be scared out of their minds. Have you ever been scared out of your mind before? Like, Total logic went out the door because you got so scared. I was in eighth grade. My parents left town. My two sisters went and stayed at a friend's house, so I had the house to myself. And in my great wisdom as an eighth grader, I decided Friday night to watch a scary movie. (laughs) Yeah, you know where this is going, don't you? Watch that scary movie, and I spent all night that night with my eyes this big, sitting on the couch, listening for every sound that that house made. Every creak, every breeze that hit the door, every bang that the air conditioner made scared the tar out of me. I can tell you that in that moment, I knew that vampires did not exist, but I heard one in the other room. And it paralyzed me. I sat on that couch all night, not going to sleep, with my heart racing, sick to my stomach because I was so afraid of something that I knew did not exist. But my fear took over. And guys, fear can take over in our faith, can't it? We get afraid of something and it paralyzes us from being able to do what God is calling us to do. So what are we afraid of? We're, fear, we're afraid of persecution, aren't we? We're afraid that somewhere down the road we're gonna get persecuted and so we step back and go, you know what, I'm just not gonna say anything about Jesus so that I can avoid that because I don't wanna be persecuted because I'm afraid of it. And so you avoid what God has put in front of you because you're afraid that you're gonna get persecuted. We're afraid of our past, aren't we? We're afraid that something we did years ago is gonna creep up and kick us in the rear sometime along, right? We get scared of our failures. We get scared of something that we did way in the past and we decide in the present not to do something because we're afraid of failing at it because we failed at something years ago or last month. We're also afraid of the future because the future is unknown, isn't it? We don't know the future, God does, but we don't. I mean, isn't that why everyone is pretty much afraid of the dark to some extent? Because when you kill the lights, you don't know what's there anymore. I live in constant fear when the lights go out that I'm gonna step on a Lego. I have a four-year-old at home, and I kid you not, the lights go out, and the little knobs on those Legos turn into little spikes. 
But that's why we're afraid of the dark is because we don't know what's theirs. That's why we're afraid of our future is because we don't know what the future holds for us. And so we hold back. We live paralyzed because we don't know what's coming. And let's face it, we're afraid of the world around us, aren't we? If you were to turn on the news right now, what is the news going to tell you? Be afraid. Be scared. There's a disease that's in Africa that's coming to America, and you need to be scared of it. I'll tell you one thing right now. My God is more powerful than any disease that's out there. And I'm not going to be afraid and not do God's work because I'm scared of something that God has dominion over, that God has power over, that God has control over. So don't be afraid of the world around you. There are missionaries in Liberia right now as we speak, loving on suffering, hurting people in the name of Jesus Christ because they're not afraid of a disease. They're more afraid to disappoint their Savior. So don't get frozen, don't get paralyzed in your fear. But Chad, OC, don't you know ISIS is out there and ISIS wants to kill all of us. I don't care. God is more powerful than any terrorist organization that's out there. He is. God is more powerful than anything that come, can come against us. So why do we live in fear of those things? The Bible is clear that fear and anxiety and worry is not godly. Those things are not in line with God's desires. He says in Philippians 4, instead of worrying, give your anxieties to God through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And then it goes on to say, if you do that perfectly, if you, if you really give those things to him with thanksgiving, he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Stop living in fear. Stop being afraid of things that God has control of. But let's be honest, we're afraid of doing God's work also, aren't we? To a certain extent, well, you know, if I go to Peach Springs, I might actually enjoy myself. And then I might want to go to San Luis, Mexico. And if I enjoy that, God may ask me to go to Thailand with Chad. That scares the tar out of me. But you know what? If God's calling me to do it, I want to do it. Don't be afraid of God's work. What did Chet challenge us with that last week? God's doing stuff here in Havasu, so get in line. Get on track with what's, what God's doing. Stop being afraid to do the things that God's doing here in Havasu. So fear, it's a big one. It's a big challenge. The last challenge that we see in Nehemiah 4 is discouragement. Discouragement. We see it in verse 12. At that time, the Jews who lived near, near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. Their own people were discouraging them. The people that should have been sending temporary missionaries and workers to help them were the ones telling them, just quit. The, it's too hard. you got to stop. Come back to us. Come back to the foreign country and leave Israel. They had it backwards. Those people that lived in the foreign countries should have been coming on their vacation time to come and help them rebuild the wall. But instead, they discouraged. That church that I worked at in Happy, Texas, it's like the second or third time I gave a message, gave a sermon to the church. I gave my message and I stepped back and I went back to the back door to greet people as they left and shake their hands and say goodbye. And an elderly man walks up, shakes my hand, and says, young man, one of these days, your excitement and your passion is going to fade. And I struggled in my faith for three months because I asked myself, do I want to be in ministry to someone that I'm not passionate about? And I can tell you right now, I'm standing in front of you 15 years later, and my passion has not dwindled one iota. It has not diminished. It probably has increased, as you can tell from me standing up here. And there are some of you in this room who have been followers of Christ for decades, and your passion is exactly the same as when you first came to know him. Don't allow discouragement to come in and paralyze you from doing the work that God has called you to do. 
So what discourages us? Difficulties. Difficult times, trials, those kinds of things come into our life. Our finances uh, get really hard or, or we go through a really testing time in our life and we start going, you know what, I just, uh, I don't know about this. And we start thinking about quitting and we start thinking about giving up and going back to our old ways. Maybe we lose someone close to us. Maybe someone in our life that, that we love passes away, and in that moment of grief, we feel discouraged, and we want to turn around and stop our passionate pursuit of the Lord. Have you ever been tempted to go back when you were discouraged? If you've ever been tempted, you've gone through that moment of discouragement, and you've been tempted to go back to the old ways, remember this, the old ways were just as bad but the hope is you have Christ who walks with you and helps you now. Those difficult times when you lose someone close to you, when things are tight or difficult, God is there walking with you, seeing you through it. You don't have that if you go back. Things are gonna be tough no matter how you look at life. Difficulties come to everybody. But the fact is, is that Christ is always gonna be there for those who follow him. So think about that. So, Doubt, fear, and discouragement. Those are really bad, negative, sad. You're like, man, when is he going to have the good stuff? When am I going to be able to smile in this? Here it is, right here. I want you to remember this. If, if you didn't get anything up to this point, remember this statement. Remember that God is for you. God is for you as a follower of Christ. He's fighting on your side. Look at verse 14. The people are discouraged. They're afraid. They're doubting whether the work can get done. And Nehemiah steps up and it says in verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. He gives a pep talk. Nehemiah steps up and says, stop fearing. Step up and let's get this done. Remember God. None of those threats on the outside are greater than our God. So let's do what he's called us to do. And he gives this amazing pep talk. The people rally and they do some things to make sure that they continue in God's work. The first thing they do is they pray. When you're going through times of doubt, or fear, or discouragement, the first step is prayer. Because let's face it, any of you worriers out there, it's not easy, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, I'm just gonna stop worrying about this. <laughs> I win! No, it doesn't work that way. Worry and fear and anxiety and doubt, all of those things are difficult to conquer, but they are possible to conquer through the power of the redemption of Jesus Christ but you've got to ask him to help. So prayer is the first step. The next thing they did is they kept watch over each other. While half of them were working, half of them watched and made sure that no one was coming to attack. When was the last time that you helped one of your brothers or sisters in Christ? When was the last time you watched out for someone else? That's what we're called to do. We are a body, we are a family of Christ and we are called to watch over each other and help each other and pick each other up and encourage each other when we fall. The next thing they did is they kept their weapons by their side 24 seven no matter what they were doing. If they were eating, if they were working, if they were walking, if they were sleeping, their sword was strapped to their side because they wanted to be ready at a moment's notice. Aren't we called to do the same thing? To put on the armor of God and be ready at all times for the spiritual attacks that are gonna come against us? So put on your spiritual armor and have it ready all the time. And the last thing they did is they were united as a body under the same vision and mission. Nehemiah had a vision, he had a mission, and he united everyone under that. Everyone knew that if they heard a certain trumpet, that they were supposed to rally to this particular place and get ready to fight. 
They knew that if something happened on the Western Wall, that they were supposed to do such and such to get things ready. They knew that if such and such happened, this is what they were supposed to do. So here's my question. Are you rallied under the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth? Are you rallied together? That's our mission statement here here at Calvary. We want to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ by loving them and teaching them the truth. Are you with us on that? Because that's our mission. That's our vision. And they were united then and we want to be united now. The great hope is found in Romans 8.31 in this lesson. Romans 8.31 says this, What then shall we say to them? To to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is more powerful than any of your circumstances. He is more powerful than any of the people who are coming against you. He is more powerful than anything you're afraid of or any doubt that comes your way or any discouragement that somebody whispers in your ear. God is greater than all of those things. And he is for us. Because we're following him. So don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And don't have doubt. But I can't read Romans 8.31 without also reading 8.32. And it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with the graciously uh, gift give us all these things? You see, guys, What I've been talking about today, the conquering of discouragement and fear and doubt only happens through a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically what happened is God is up there and at some point in time, God sent his one and only son to this earth. And his son, Jesus, lived a perfect life. He did not sin one time so that he could be a perfect sacrifice for us. And then when he was 33 years old, he died on a cross as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And on the third day after that, he rose from the grave and then he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And if you want to be in heaven with him, if you want to sit with Jesus and you want to live in heaven and be saved from hell, it's about having a life-changing relationship with the person who died for you. We don't follow Jesus because we're compelled to or we have to. We follow him because it's about a relationship. I've been married for 10 years and I love my wife and I don't flirt with other women, not because I feel obligated to do so because I'm a husband. I don't do so out of duty because I'm the husband to Jana. I do so because I love Jana. I don't follow Christ and try to live my life for him because I feel like I'm obligated to or I have to do a bunch of rules to make him happy. I follow him because I love him. I follow him and I follow what he desires for me because I desperately love the one who came and died for me and saved me. It's not about a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not about a list of rules. It's about having a relationship with the God who came to this earth and died for you. That's what being a Christian is. That's what a follower of Christ is. It's someone that is so in love with the person who saved their eternal life that they wanna make him happy. And you may be sitting in this room and have no idea what I'm talking about. You've never accepted a relationship with Jesus Christ And we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that at the end of the service. And I'll walk you through that and I'll instruct you on what we're gonna do. So join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this thing that happens with Nehemiah and the people and the example that it is to us. Knowing that things are gonna come against us, we're gonna have doubts and we're gonna have fears and we're gonna have discouragement that's gonna come against us and try and tear us down. But the fact of the matter is, is that you are greater than any and all of those things. And God, we place our faith in you. We trust you to take care of those things deep down inside of us. Help us to remember that you are always for us, not against us. And that you will defeat anything that does come against us. 
So Lord, help us to have that kind of faith. Help us to take the steps necessary to live out that faith, just like the people around Nehemiah did. We thank you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.